All right, let's begin. Um, hello and welcome to the traditional Chinese medicine as an alternative method of treatment webinar. Um, we want to thank you for joining us. My name is Sarah Morinian, and I am the social media program coordinator at the Institute for Neuro Medicine at Nova Southeastern University. Uh, before we begin, I want to go over some housekeeping roles. Um, this is a one hour webinar with a Q&A session at the end. Today's recording will be sent in the webinar wrap up email that you'll be receiving in the coming days and will be available on our YouTube channel. Also, if you would notice within your control panel, there's a Q&A tab. If you have any questions during the presentation, uh, please feel free to type it within that section and Dr. Hunko will do her best in answering your questions. I wanna thank you again for joining us today and I'll begin by introducing today's speaker, Dr. Jacqueline Hunko. Dr. Hunko is assistant professor at the Dr. Kieran C. Patel College of Osteopathic Medicine at Nova Southeastern University where she provides traditional Chinese medicine services at our Kendall and Davy Clinic. Dr. Hunko is a medically trained doctor who is certified in acupuncture, Chinese herbology, and oriental medicine from the National Certification Commission for Acupuncture and Oriental, Men oriental Medicine. Her knowledge of Western medicine and, altern and natural alternatives creates a powerful combination of modern technology and ancient therapies that have been used to treat a vast majority of health conditions. During her extensive 20 year career as a healthcare professional, she has acquired training and certifications in integrative nutrition, sound healing, meditation and breath work, epigenetics, auricular acupuncture, anti-aging, cosmetic acupuncture, neuroacupuncture, immunology, sports acupuncture, acupuncture injection therapy, and addiction, and addiction medicine. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over now to you, Dr. Hugo. Thank you so much, Sarah, and welcome everybody to talk today about traditional Chinese medicine as an alternative method of treatment. I am passionate about what I do, and I want to just tell everybody a little bit about what we can do for you. Go ahead and advance. Next. So traditional Chinese medicine has different branches. Acupuncture, I'm going to focus mostly on acupuncture today, but I'm also going to discuss cupping, moxa, herbal medicine, herbal medicine, sorry, nutrition, sound healing, therapeutic body work, meditation, tai chi, and qigong. Next. So traditional Chinese medicine is one of the fastest growing movements in healthcare today. We are seeing acupuncture clinics in major hospitals, the Cleveland Clinic has acupuncturists, UM has acupuncturists, I'm at Nova. There's um, a lot of cancer centers that use a lot of acupuncturists and fertility clinics, the same. So it's, it's slowly coming to be where it should be. We should be using it in every aspect of medicine. Next slide. So in Florida, acupuncture physicians undergo four years of training and we're considered primary care providers. We place careful attention on the physiological, emotional, and environmental aspects, taking into consideration not only just the body, but also looking at the body, the mind, and spirit connection between all of those. Next. So a little history on acupuncture. Acupuncture is one of the oldest medicines it's over 3,000 years old, and it was described as a medicine focusing on qi, which is the energy, and shui, which is blood. So it's in, in acupuncture, is the insertion of needles in the specific points in the body. There's over 2,000 points now that we use to cover 12 meridians in Chinese medicine. Next slide. So when patients ask me, how did the Chinese come up with acupuncture? I always think of this picture because in this picture, you see the little cavemen with um, spears hitting the mammoth on the back and then the neck gets better. So I assumed it was something along that aspect, how they came to know which points work for what. Next slide. In the US, it's been, it hasn't been that long. It's in, it was brought in after um, President Nixon visited China with his, with, the reporter Harry Kissinger, who during his time in China developed appendicitis, needed an emergency appendectomy, of which he 
underwent acupuncture for the anesthesia and for the post-op care. He was then so impressed with the treatment that he brought it into the U.S. So he started writing about it and it was recognized then. In 1974, the Lincoln Hospital in New York was one of the first hospitals to use acupuncture in the form of auricular therapy for detoxing patients. It's what we call now the NADA protocol. It's one of the most commonly used for detox treatments. In 1995, the FDA declared the acupuncture needle to be a medical device. And in 1997, acupuncture was labeled mainstream medicine by the National Institute of Health. Next. So what is chi? Chi is life, chi is energy. Without chi, no life is possible. And chi continuously moves within our body, between people, between objects. It's in the earth. It's in the food we eat. So everything that we touch, everything that we ingest, everything we are is chi. So any blockage of chi or deficiencies of chi or an excess of chi could cause an imbalance. That imbalance is going to cause an illness. And then that's where acupuncture and herbal medicine comes in because we try to balance the imbalance. Next, yin and yang theory. The two concepts that are most important in Chinese medicine are one that we just spoke, the qi and then the yin and yang. Yin and yang are completely opposites, but they need each other. They're, they're indispensable of one another. So without yang, you can't have yin and without yin, you can't have yang. Yang, yang is the male, yin is the female, they're opposites. You have yin is dark, yang is light. So when the yin and yang are in harmony, there is health, there's well-being and contentment. When, that, when there's disharmony between yin and yang, being you could have too much yang or too little yin, there's an imbalance. And when that imbalance occurs is when we have illness, pain, and suffering. Next. So Chinese medicine compares the body to a garden. And for those of us who have gardens, we know the garden nurtured. We must water the garden. We need to pull our weeds. We need to be mindful of the pests that come into the garden. So all this needs to be done in order for the garden to thrive. We have to look at the garden every day to detect any changes and make adjustments as needed. So regular acupuncture treatments, even when there's no signs or symptoms, help maintain wealth and well-being. Next. This is a diagram that I like to show because here we talk about the 12 meridians that we find in traditional Chinese medicine and in relation to different elements to different emotions, to different tastes, and to different body parts and different seasons. And as you see, there's arrows connecting them, meaning that the, for example, the liver and gallbladder channel, if it's in excess, it's gonna affect the heart channel, which is gonna be affecting the spleen channel. So it's all connected. The liver and gallbladder channel holds the emotion of anger. When I see patients sometimes and they, they hold on to a lot of anger, we need to work on blocking the liver meridian to help them get over that. And it also with the seasons, it's which, you know, during which season is these meridians more dominant? In the, in the spleen and stomach, it's higher, you know, more, more dominant in the late summer harvest. Okay, and, and Lung is another important one. We see it a lot with patients undergoing grief. They suffer, you know, asthma, shortness of breath. So it's always something that we have to take into consideration the emotions and the organ manifestations associated with each meridian and how they affect one another. Next. Which I'm uh, moving on to the next important diagram, which is the traditional Chinese medicine organ clock. During the 24 hours, qi is moving in two hour intervals throughout all the organs. And then within the meridians, it's important to note what times they're at their highest, working the hardest and at their highest potential. For example, the large intestine channel is at its, its most energized and working the hardest between 5 and 7 a.m. So we always 
tell patients, you know, the best time to establish a bowel movement would be in that time because the energy of that organ is going to be at its highest potential. The best time to eat breakfast is between 7 and 9 a.m. Why? Because the stomach chi is going to be working the hardest and it's going to be energized the most. The worst time to eat is after 8 p.m. Because at that time, it we're ready, our body's ready for detoxing phase, which is what happens occurs throughout the till five o'clock in the morning. And the stomach and spleen are going to be weakest at 8 p.m. Next. So what happens when you make an appointment for traditional Chinese medicine? After doing a detailed history. And in that history, you know, we take everything into consideration, the emotions, you know, your past, your childhood, any traumas, and of course, what's going on, any smells, we notice different things. One important thing during the physical exam is the tongue diagnosis. With a tongue diagnosis, we're able to find a pattern, a pattern which is going to be according to one of the 12 meridians. With that pattern, we're able to determine how we're going to treat that patient, whether it's with acupuncture, whether it's with herbal medicine, et cetera. And also nutrition also takes a place. The treatments vary between 45 to 60 minutes, depending on the condition of the patient and what we find. Deficient patients, we don't treat that long because they don't need to be drained more than what they are. And usually, need, not that needles drain, but deficiency we don't want to deplete them anymore. So if a patient is in excess, then we give them a longer treatment. Next. So how many treatments are needed? This is a question that I get asked on the first treatment, and that's hard to say because it's based on an individual basis. Every patient is different. I have patients that do well after their first treatment, don't need to come back. And I have patients that need ongoing treatments for years. I think usually the results are seen between three to 10 treatments is when you notice the maximum benefit. If all this is done with taking herbal medicines, doing the proper nutrition, doing your meditation, Qigong, the results are even better. Next. So acupuncture is a whole body system which can influence the patient by promoting health and well-being, preventing illness, treating various medical conditions. It's more or less painless. It's very safe and it's all natural. Next. So the World Health Organization approves acupuncture to treat almost 100 conditions. Out of these, back pain, treat a lot of sciatic, um, depression, insomnia, anxiety, morning sickness, PMS, addictions, like I mentioned earlier, and so much more. Next. Next question I get asked, does acupuncture hurt? Well, there are needles. So this is a great example of how small the needles are. In the top, you see the matchstick. Then you see the hypodermic needle, the sewing needle, and then the acupuncture needle is one-fourth the size of the sewing needle. The facial acupuncture needle is even half the size of that acupuncture needle. So they're, they're like hair-thin needles, and some do hurt. It's more like a mosquito bite, I always say. Next. So this is a little busy slide, but in a nutshell, how does acupuncture work? There's been a lot of theories and a lot of studies done. And basically, one of the most important thing is it activates the parasympathetic nervous system, helps you relax. And it alters the immune system activity. It increases blood flow around the needle. It reduces inflammation. It loses the fascial tissue and it regulates intestinal motility. Next. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the immune system since we are at the Institute. That's what we focus on. Acupuncture has been shown in studies to restore the balance between Th1 and Th2 activity, enhancing natural killer cell activity. Brain imaging studies show that it activates a hypothalamus regulating the autonomic system, again, activating the parasympathetic system. A lot of autoimmune diseases and immune problems, the sympathetic is on overdrive. So acupuncture is great in these cases because it downregulates the sympathetic nervous system, bringing you into a parasympathetic system. Next. I like to show this functional MRI. Now we're able to see more what happens when you activate certain acupuncture points and stimulate them. 
This is one of the points used in the hand for pain. And this is, shows the different parts of the brain that are activated and deactivated following acupuncture stimulation. So it's just increased blood flow to those areas. Next. So how about if you don't like needles? I have patients that are needle phobic and especially children are the ones I focus more with laser acupuncture. So laser acupuncture is done with cold lasers. They don't produce heat and it regenerates the cells, decreases pain, reduces inflammation, improves circulation, stimulates hair growth, and much more. I resort to laser acupuncture in children, especially nowadays I'm seeing a lot of anxiety, stress, especially during these COVID times. And children come in and they're in and out in 20 minutes. You stimulate the points using a laser for 10, 15 seconds at each point, and they're done with their treatment and they do great. Next. So when should you have acupuncture? The time is now. You should not wait till you have any symptoms. The, it's, I always say that acupuncture is best used as prevention. It treats the root, not the problem. I mean, to treat, treats, the, treats the root, not just the symptom. So acupuncture works on the whole body. Like I mentioned earlier, we could work on many ailments at the same time in one acupuncture treatment. It helps relax and release the overburdened areas and boost the weak ones. It helps balance the body. The mind and spirit are also soothed with acupuncture. Next. One thing I recommend to patients to do at home is acupressure. Acupressure could be done with uh, using your hands and fingers. This is a very important point, which is called large intestine four. And it's right here in the hand. And just by pressing this point, you'll notice you have a little tenderness. When you find that tender spot, you massage that area for 10, 15 seconds. And if that is done consistently, it's very effective. Another, another area that's great for massaging and doing acupressure is the ears. The ears are innervated by the parasympathetic, the vagus nerve. So it helps clear stress. It helps relieve stress and calm the mind. So massaging your ears, especially from the top all the way down to the bottom, especially in the evenings when you're getting ready for bed. Next, Chinese herbal medicine. Traditional Chinese medicine makes use of herbs and herbal formulas to strengthen organ function and support good health. So I'm sure many people are familiar, especially nowadays, we're seeing more superfoods, goji berries have been used in Chinese medicine for thousands of years. And those, those are amazing. And the organs that they work best is the liver, the kidney, the eyes, and the lungs. Goji berries are good to nourish the blood. They're, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. They're great to benefit these organs. Ginseng is something that I'm sure we're all familiar with. Ginseng has been shown in Chinese medicine to increase the qi. It's great for energy. It's great for fatigue. There's the American ginseng and the Chinese ginseng. They both have the similar properties. Astralagus, which is called in Chinese medicine, Huang Qi, is one of the most amazing herbs in my, in my book. It enhances the immune system, reduces inflammation. But one of the most amazing things it does, it's been shown, it's been shown lately to work enhancing, increasing the telomere, the length of the telomeres. So it's been shown to have an anti-aging effect. There's a lot of supplements now with that. Sleep and, sorry, go ahead. Sleep and TCM. I'm going to touch a little bit on how we see sleep in Chinese medicine. Sleep is very important. The more you need at least seven to nine hours of sleep, the more sleep before midnight, the better quality of sleep. Go to bed no later than 10 30 p.m. because all the organs that are going to be at their highest potential and mostly energized are all the detoxing ones so we need that detox the liver the kidneys all those need to be resting and doing their job reading before bed no screens meaning no computers no phone anything that has the blue light which interferes with melatonin is not advised to do no caffeine after 2 p.m and it's been shown that sleep deprivation of less than seven hours triples your chances of getting sick. Next, a little bit on nutrition. 
eat breakfast between seven and nine. It's important not to skip breakfast for the reason that I showed with the organ clock. The stomach and the spleen are at that time most energized and most functioning. And don't overeat or undereat, no late night eating. Stop eating after 8 p.m. The stomach and spleen are the weakest then. Avoid cold beverages with meals. Avoid mental stimulation and emotional stress while eating. That brings us into the mindful eating, don't eating on the go. Foods intervene in ten, internally in the flow of energy within the body. Like I mentioned earlier when we talked about chi, food, every food, everything we put into our body has a life force. Food is one of those. Like our father of medicine, Hippocrates, quoted, let thy food be thy medicine and let thy medicine be thy food. Next. A little bit on exercise. Avoiding exercise is important because it depletes your chi. Exercise should make you feel energized, not fatigued. Moving your body daily moves the chi. It's important to do that because if we don't move, what happens is the chi becomes stagnant and it accumulates. And then it causes the blood, which goes with the chi, to accumulate. And that's where pain sets in. So good exercises are hiking, biking, yoga, tai chi, qigong, dancing, basically anything that gets you moving and having fun. Next. So according to the latest research, the average human body is 20% water and 80% stress. Next. On that note, let's talk a little bit about stress. During these COVID times, we've seen more stress than ever, at least I have in my practice. I think, you know, going from children all the way to the elderly, it's something we can't really get away from. Um, one of the main factors that stress does is suppresses the immune system. It causes um, activation of the sympathetic nervous system. But, but then again, stress is healthy in small amounts. In large amounts, cortisol, which is a stress hormone, is released, which lowers white blood cells and prevents cellular heating. Next. According to the American Psychological Association, the latest stress survey, 66% of people regularly experience physical symptoms of stress and 63% experience psychological symptoms. Next. So I'm gonna talk, I have four cases which I'm gonna present during this talk. The first one is a case on high blood pressure. This 55 year old female came from her primary care office with three high blood pressure readings. See the note, first one is 160 over 105. She had 170, 185 over 120. She came in to see me to try alternative medicine before starting on medications that her doctor wanted prescribed. She came in twice weekly for two weeks, then weekly for six weeks. Her blood pressure readings, post acupuncture treatment started at 155 or 110, and at the end of two weeks, 140 over 95. Then for the following four weeks, they went down all the way to 120 over 85. I still see this patient, her blood pressure now when she comes in, she still comes in once every couple of weeks, is about 110 over 75 she is. She was advised to drink her hibiscus tea, which helps with blood pressure regulation. She's on magnesium supplementation. She does her breathing exercises and meditation daily. Next, electroacupuncture. Electroacupuncture is acupuncture on steroids. It stimulates the acupuncture points. It's great for pain, paralysis, Bell's palsy, edema, and improved circulation. Next, auriculotherapy. Auriculotherapy, the ear is one of the microsystems in Chinese medicine, meaning that the whole body can be treated just by using the ear. As you see in the diagram on the right, the top of the ear is where the legs are. So it's a homunculus, which is an upside down fetus. At the bottom of the ear, you see the head. So the whole body we could treat just by using the ear. We treat PTSD. It's very common, like I mentioned earlier, for addictions for detoxing, for patients who want to stop smoking. I've had multiple patients with who want to lose weight and stop smoking, and we've had great results just by using five needles in the ear once a week. Next, a little bit more on auricular acupuncture. Like I mentioned earlier, the ear is enervated by the vagus nerve, so it raises the vagal tone, regulating cardiovascular, respiratory, gastrointestinal, and endocrine systems can lower the heart rate and blood pressure, 
accelerate blood flow and heart rate variability. Next. Case number two is going to anxiety and panic attacks. This 25-year-old medical student came struggling with frequent panic attacks and high anxiety. She was taking Xanax and undergoing psychotherapy, but the anxiety was still out of control. After her TCM diagnosis was made, acupuncture treatments began weekly. After her first treatment, she felt relaxed, but no difference with panic attacks. However, following the second treatment, she was 10% less anxious for, for about, and lasted for about a week. After her eighth session, she was 50% better, having less panic attacks, and was able to cut back on her Xanax. After her 12th visit, no more panic attacks and no more Xanax. She continued also to come in every couple weeks. Next, Korean hand acupuncture. It's another microsystem, as you, I don't know if you can see it very well because it's very busy there, but all the whole body is depicted in the hand. One important one is the middle finger in the top or the middle finger is the head. So I always tell pain, if you have a headache, something that you could do is just press till you feel that tender point, you get the, the tip of the pencil or pen and just massage the area for 10, 15 seconds. And again, just like any other acupressure, it's consistency, which is gonna be key. Next, scalp acupuncture, also called neuroacupuncture. Stimulates the brain cells are related to the impaired functions. This is used very commonly in patients with stroke and paralysis. We've seen it now starting to be used in Parkinson's disease, autism, ADHD, ADD. I use a lot of scalp acupuncture for patients with mental health, depression, anxiety. Next. Case number three, chronic low back pain. 62-year-old male golfer who had chronic low back pain for over 15 years following a motor vehicle accident. Pain level was a seven over 10 when he came in to see me. He was taking NSAIDs and had multiple nerve blocks over the years. Acupuncture with electric stimulation and cupping was done twice weekly for four weeks. His pain level after the four treatments was a two over 10. He was also given exercises, strength in low, his lower back and given some Chinese herbs. Next. A little on cosmetic acupuncture. We call it the new Botox, no tox, because there's no tox toxins associated with cosmetic acupuncture. Here you have two celebrities who love acupuncture. And how ac cosmetic acupuncture works, it's the same, same theory it works in the body. By introducing a needle into the face, you're gonna that needle is going to cause a micro trauma, which is going to bring more blood to the area, bringing more collagen, more elastin. So you're going to have a nicer, natural glow, more fuller. And my, the next question I get asked, how many treatments? It's not an immediate effect. It takes between six to 10 treatments in order to notice something. Next, cupping. There's two types of cupping. We use fire cupping, which is the classic, and suction cupping. Cupping became famous after Michael Phelps, the Olympian, while he was doing a swim, had all his cupping marks, and now it's used all over the place with athletes. It's great for improving circulation. It's great for pain. It's great for digestion. It opens the chest and lungs. Next. So how does cupping work? By, cu by causing the vacuum, <clears throat> excuse me, it causes different layers of tissue separation, which causes, again, a microtrauma and tearing. As a result of this, the new blood vessels are being formed and the blood and nutrients begin to flow to the damaged areas. The healing chemicals get released into the tissue and promote healing. Next, moxibustion. Moxi moxa is a Chinese herb called Artemisia vulgaris, also known as mugwort. And what we do is we place it over acupuncture needles or over the body. It warms the needles, it moves the blood, and it warms the channels. It's great for pain. It's great for patients who have constipation or diarrhea. It's great for fatigue. It's one of the most common things that it's known for is to rotate a breech baby. There's a point on the foot on the small pinky that we just use acupuncture mox and the baby turns. It's pretty amazing. Next. One thing I recommend to patients if they want to have longevity is to do moxa on this acupuncture point seven, stomach 36. 
this is called the longevity point. Chinese do the, have been doing this for thousands of years. And what it, this point now shows that it helps bring more blood flow and more white blood cells and hemoglobin. And it also helps with lymphatics, helps with increasing energy, endurance, stamina, and it also improves digestion. Next. Case on long COVID, a 50-year-old woman suffered from a variety of symptoms for eight months after an episode of COVID-19. After her first treatment with acupuncture, her palpitations stopped and tightness in the chest improved. She started a gradual exercise program, had six more acupuncture treatments, and two months later was functioning much better with less fatigue and better quality of life. She also comes in now for once a month for her follow-ups, her tune-ups. Next. Sound healing. Sound healing synchronizes brain waves to achieve profound states of relaxation, helping to restore the normal vibratory frequencies of the cells in our body. One example I always give, our, our cells communicate using frequencies. So when I use vibration healing, I always tell this is getting down to a cellular level. Another example is that when I use the tuning fork, I always explain to patients the same way that lithotripsy, which is used to break up kidney stones, is using a 130 hertz frequency that's how powerful frequency is that it's able to destroy the renal stones so how much more powerful can the frequency healing be in the human body next qigong the method to repel illness and prolong life according to chinese medicine contains elements of meditation relaxation training martial arts techniques and breathing exercises intended to cultivate chi and transmit it to all the body organs. Next. Breath work. Breath work is not a new technique. Shamans have been doing it for thousands of years. It's still the foundation of many, many powerful practices like meditation, yoga, and qigong. Engaging the diaphragm, our pr primary breathing muscle, consciously breathing consciously into the belly is fantastic for activating the parasympathetic nervous system and promoting our rest digest and restore and repair response meditation immediate benefits can include lower heart rate and increased relaxation longer benefits include enhanced immune function increased ability to focus and overall sense of well-being keeps everything stable and balanced next Well, that's it for my talk. And now I just want to introduce this part. We're going to do a little exercise in breath work and meditation. I'm going to introduce my son, Daniel. He is a first year medical student and yoga practitioner, yoga teacher. So on that note, we'll start. I'm going to bring in Daniel. We'll, we'll do the breath work for about five minutes and then move over to Q&A. Hello, everyone. So we're just going to do a quick little five-minute meditation. So this is going to help you operate from a calmer place. Um, so we'll just be focusing on the breath. And um, like Dr. Hunko said, there's countless benefits to meditation. And there's no wrong way to do it. So as long as you're just trying, as long as you're staying with the breath at the point of focus, you're getting all the benefits from it. And even if it's very difficult, as long as you're trying, like I said, you're getting all the benefits. So first, just rock back and forth a little bit. Find a comfortable position. And then we're going to take a deep breath in through the nose. Breathe deeply into the belly. And then open up the mouth at a deep sigh out. Let's do this two more times. We'll take a full breath into the belly. And open up the mouth. Just sigh it out. Let it all go. Nice. One more time. Full breath into the belly. And then open up the mouth. Let it all go. Nice. Now I invite you to close down the eyes and just bring attention to the body. And just see what emotions are present right now. And bring curiosity to these sensations. And just know that right now where you are, you are okay. And you can relax. You do almost like a body scan as if you have a searchlight. And you're scanning the inside of the body. And now take another deep breath in through the nose. And exhale slowly. 
Remember, you are okay. You can relax right now. Now bring your hands on your belly. And then take three deep breaths deep into the belly. So think like your belly is like a balloon and you're creating space here, increasing the space in the abdominal cavity. And then exhale fully. Two more times. Take another full breath in. And full breath out. Full breath in. And long, full breath out. So the deeper you breathe into the belly, the longer you make the exhales, the more you activate the parasympathetic nervous system, which is going to help to calm the body down. Nice. And now relax the arms down and see if you can feel the breath moving in the body without the hands to help. So find one spot in the body that you feel the breath moving through the body the most and just keep your attention there. Try to feel every breath that comes in and every breath that comes out. We're going to start counting the breaths. So as you inhale, count one. And as you exhale, count two. Inhale, three. Exhale, four. We're going to go all the way up to number 10. And then once you get to 10, just start again at one. So on the next breath, start as you inhale, count one. As you exhale, count two. And I'll give you a couple moments to just practice this again. Going up to the number 10 and then starting again at one. And something that's normal that can happen here is that the mind starts to wander. That's okay. That's what the mind does. But just gently bring the mind back to the awareness, to the point of focus, which is the breath. Again, counting the inhales, counting the exhales. And I'll give you a moment to just practice this by yourself. Try to feel every sensation as the breath comes in and the breath comes out. And just do one more round. Remember, it's okay for the mind to wander. Just gently bring it right back to the breath as soon as you notice. Nice. Now close the eyes. And listen to the sounds that you can hear around you as you sit with the eyes closed. Listen to the sounds furthest away. And listen to the sounds that are closer to you, maybe in the room that you're in. And just bringing the awareness to what these sounds are. Remember when the mind wanders, which it does, just gently come right back to the breath or to the sounds, to the point of focus. Nice. Now let that awareness go of the breath of the sounds and bring the awareness to the body. And see if you can feel your whole body sitting here in space. So just observing the space that the body occupies. It may feel heavy, warm, relaxed. It's okay. Just breathe into it. Nice. Now I invite you to add a sense of gratitude in. So just ask yourself what it or who are you grateful for right now in this moment? Or what or who do you love? And it can be anything and everything. And just feel these feelings of warmth and goodwill start to spread through your body. And I invite you to lift the left and right corners of the mouth and invite a light smile onto the face. And then when you're ready, gently blink, blink the eyes open. And just maybe take a moment here before you start moving around. Just become mindfully aware of how your body feels, how the mind feels. Maybe you feel a little bit more calm, more relaxed, more collected. And just know that this is always inside of you for you to tap into whenever you'd like. And you alone hold the key. Thank you for participating.
Okay. Thank you, Danny. Hope everybody enjoyed that as much as I did and I, as much as I do. Sarah, are we ready for questions? Yeah, let's okay. uh, let's do Q and A. Some uh, questions that came in. Uh, do you want to read them off? You want me to read them off for you? Okay, no, I'll take it. Okay, okay, the first one: How does TCM compare relate to Ayurvedic practices? There are two different. Ayurvedic is based on the Indian teachings. So it is different, but we use similar herbs and the nutrition is, is also similar in the TCM aspect, but um, they're, they're not the same, but they, they hold a lot of things in common. Like, you know, the, the whole balancing, it's all, you know, it's all about balance, whether it's Ayurvedic or TCM. I think she has the next question. Does cosmetic app acupuncture help with acne yes it does i mean acupuncture itself helps with acne next question does insurance cover your services such as sound work so you do this in the office yes some insurances do cover alternative medicine and acupuncture you would need to find out with your insurance company nowadays you know more insurances are covering it so you just need to find out if yours does. Next question, is acupuncture safe for people with complex regional pain? Do you know? Yes, acupuncture is safe and it would benefit because again, one of the main things with the regional pain syndrome is a lot of inflammation in the body. So this is something either the needles or even the laser would help. It depends on how the patient, you know, what's how we see the patient the first time, if the patient's going to be able to sustain having needles placed. In those cases, we don't place that many needles, just maybe five or six that are necessary, or if not, we could always use laser. For needle phobic friends, is there a limit to how many things can be treated with cold laser? Absolutely not. We could be there for a while. How about I read them off to you? Um, okay. Someone, uh, someone said, uh, I have fibromyalgia and I am 72. Would your practice be helpful for my pain and fatigue? Yes, absolutely. I do treat a lot of um, fibromyalgia and, and it would definitely help because again, fibromyalgia is a lot of inflammation. So one of the benefits of acupuncture is working on the inflammatory response. So definitely. And the fatigue, of course, it'll help. Sorry, I was muted. Oh, uh, sorry. Dr. Nko, uh, you mentioned that acupuncture is best for preventative medicine since MECFS patients are very sick. Do you have a different approach? How much does that impact your approach? Well, with MECFS patients also have to be taking on an individual basis. Once I see the patient and I determine what their TCM diagnosis is, meaning what pattern they have, I treat that accordingly. Yes, it's different because a lot of these patients are weak. So their treatments will not be as long as other patients that come in for, let's say, athletes that I treat for an injury. So these patients are more delicate in the treatment. Now I do, you know, give them nutritional recommendations. There's other things. A lot of them are already taking a lot of medications. So there's a lot, there's a lot we can do. Um, another insurance question, it was, uh, does Medicare cover sound therapy? Absolutely not. Unfortunately, they don't need, they only cover acupuncture and it's only for low back pain. I think eventually the more, you know, they're seeing the benefits. I mean, the fact that they even cover it for low back pain is a big move forward. So I think it's just a matter of time. Uh, can acupuncture help with, I'm probably going to be saying this wrong, cyphosis? It's kyphosis. Kyphosis. Yeah. <laughs> I've had yep. patients with scoliosis, which is similar. Now, it doesn't correct the anatomical changes I need, but it could help with the relaxing the muscles that are in the ligaments that are on the spine. So therefore, you know, there will be some improvements as far if there's any pain involved. 
those are some really great questions. Um, can acupuncture help with menopause symptoms? Absolutely. That's a big one. A lot of, I see a lot of women with menopause and especially, you know, depending what symptoms are going on, there's great acupuncture is great in itself. And then there's great Chinese herbs that we use for menopause and also some nutritional recommendations. Uh, I believe your presentation, you mentioned it did help, but um, someone asked, I know you brought, um, you brought up children and increased anxiety nowadays. Uh, does acupuncture help with ADHD? It does. Absolutely. And we use for children, we use the ear, which is a little bit simpler for if they tolerate needles. I mean, it depends how old the child is, but again, the laser and the ear is amazing. And the laser acupuncture is going to be, it works amazing for kids. And for ADHD, there's so much we could do with supplements and nutrition and the TCM. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, what are the charges if insurance doesn't cover it? Uh, I guess they kind of want a pricing menu here. Right. And I think it, at Nova, I think the charge is um, 100 or 105. I'm not, don't quote me on that one. I think it's between 100 and 110. Okay. And that's so for the full evaluation. And, you know, the reason why it's based on Medicare guidelines, you know, these, but um, I think it's between 100 and 110. Okay. And what's included in the uh, 100? Everything, the evaluation, the treatment, if you need cupping, if you need... Moxa. Well, I don't do Moxa at the hospital because, you know, some people are sensitive to smell, but I will give you a Moxa stick. Um, so everything's included in the $100. That's great. Okay. I'm going to um, actually put up the, at the end, I'm going to put up uh, the clinic's phone number. So if anyone's interested in uh, setting up an appointment, uh, it will be available to you. Okay. Um, Uh, can the cold laser treat all the same issues that needle acupuncture treats? Like, is there any? It does. Okay. It does. They okay. might not be as, you know, as um, intense as far as like the results it might take a little bit longer, but it does work. Okay. Um, easiest way to find a TCM physician. Well, we have a TCM physician here with us today. That's right. uh, <laughs> <laughs> Um, but if you're not in the South Florida area, uh, Dr. Hingo, do you have any suggestions about how they can find a physician? You know, you just want to find somebody who's NCCAOM certified. Cause I mean, a lot of people could say they do acupuncture and that certification sure. is very important. Yeah, you want to certify that they're certified and they're experienced and yeah, you just want to make sure they have their certifications. <laughs> right. Um, uh, one, uh, the last question we have is, can acupuncture help unblock areas impacted by lymphedema? Yes, because it helps with the lymphatics. Absolutely. So like the drainage and yes. And then the cupping will help too. Okay. Um, that's all the questions. Does anyone okay. else have any more questions? We have a few more moments left, so. I'm going to put the, the phone number and email address. There you go. So we have a, if you want to set up an appointment, we have our Davy clinic, our Kendall clinic, um, whichever one is closer to you. And uh, Dr. Hunko's email address, if you have any questions for her, we have a few more questions. If we come in for, a, uh, someone asked, if we come in for a session with a specific issue, what areas do you focus on during the, during the session? Whatever needs to be addressed. I mean, if or without than, a spe specific issue. Sorry. If, if someone areas? comes in without a specific well, issue, there's, what there's areas? points that we do for general well being. So, I mean, as soon as I see the person and I look at their tongue and check their pulse and go through all the questions, you know, I will decide. I'm very, um, I consider myself an intuitive healer. So, once I, what's best for the patient is always the main goal. Okay. Um, all right. So that's all the questions we've got. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And thank oh, you, no, everyone, for attending. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, if you are interested in coming to the clinic or setting up an appointment, uh, 
like I mentioned, Dr. Hugo's uh, email address is there for questions, setting up an appointment. There are our two clinics phone numbers. Um, and uh, on behalf of the Institute for Neuromedia Medicine, I want to thank everyone for joining us today and have a safe and wonderful weekend. Good have day. a wonderful weekend, everyone. Hi, thank you. Bye, Sarah. Thank you.